Good afternoon uh, for those in Bahrain and good morning to those who are following from the US from USA. Uh, welcome to today's event, uh, which is a, a joint between Darasat and the US Embassy. Uh, the title is The Role of Think Tanks in Developing Polish Positions uh, and Priorities. My name is Omar al -Abaitli. I'll be moderating today's event. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking uh, Arabia Qureshi from the U.S. Embassy for help in facilitating and facilitating and organizing this event. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two distinguished congressmen or former congressmen uh, uh, with us today. Uh, the first is uh, Congressman Michael D. Bishop, who is the founder and president of the American Council PLC and also co-president of IPSC U.S., a national association of independent professionals. During his tenure in the U.S. Congress, which was 2014 to 2018, uh, Congressman Bishop served on the House Committee on Ways and Means, the Judiciary, the Higher Education, and the Higher Education. Uh, Congressman Bishop worked directly with both Presidents Obama and Trump to sign into law and legislation, uh, to sign into law and legislation to approve higher education and tax policy. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome Congressman Bobby Etheridge. Uh, my, uh, Congressman Bishop is Michigan and Congressman Etheridge is uh, North Carolina. He's elected to the North Carolina House of Representatives in 78, serving as chairman of the House Appropriations Committee from 84 to 88. He introduced a basic education plan which focused on providing millions of dollars to the public school budget, establishing a core curriculum for all students in K-12. In 1988, Etheridge, Congressman Etheridge was elected su state superintendent of public instruction where he cut the state's bureaucracy in the Department of Public Construction by 25% and instituted an accountability system that has greatly improved student task stores. So uh, uh, very much a, an experienced and started, started lineup. Uh, to the format of today's event is we'll be having uh, each congressman uh, give a, a short introductory uh, set of remarks on the topic, which is the role of think tanks. Thereafter, I will be uh, 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 moderating a discussion between the three of us on various things. I'll be posing them some potentially vexing uh, think tank questions. Uh, hopefully I'll get them uh, uh, sweating. And then, uh, and then after that, we'll open up for Q&A with the audience. Uh, and with that, uh, on, on, we'll go alphabetically and north to south. Uh, we'll start with Congressman Bishop, uh, please. Well, good morning, and, uh, or I should say good morning or afternoon, wherever I might find you. Thank you so much for including me in this discussion. My name is Mike Bishop, and um, I'm a former member of Congress from the state of Michigan. Um, my background is um, a little bit uh, different than, than uh, a lot of members of Congress. I, I came from the private sector. Uh, for, for the most part, I'm a practicing attorney. I, I am a... Um, uh, business attorney here in the United States. Uh, I have been so for 27 years. Uh, I did have some background in state government as well. Uh, I served in the Michigan legislature and the Michigan House and in the Michigan Senate. And while in the Michigan Senate, I was the Senate Majority Leader, uh, which uh, is a leadership position in that, uh, in that chamber. Um, in my role as an attorney, I've, I've been a prosecutor, I have been a defense counsel, but uh, I have kind of slowly evolved into more of um, a business attorney and uh, lots of things going on here in the state of Michigan. And uh, we, uh, we went through some pretty difficult financial economic times back in the 2000 range. Uh, Michigan has turned around dramatically, uh, led uh, by our our flagship city, the city of Detroit, the auto capital of the world, or what the original auto capital of the world. Um, I guess we can't say that anymore, uh, but we have uh, seen a dramatic turnaround in our economy and, and Michigan is doing well, uh, short of the uh, pandemic. And that's caused us all to kind of hesitate, but I, I do believe that the long-term looks good here in Michigan and for the city of Detroit. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to serve my community in both state and federal government um, and to be a part of things like this. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Congressman Bishop. Congressman Etheridge. Thank you. And uh, it is a great honor to be with you. Uh, and hello to everybody uh, who is watching. Uh, as Mike said, uh, in my years of public service, I actually spent 19 years in business. So my, business, my background is in business as is my education. 
even though I spent time at the state, local, and 14 years in Congress where I served on the Ways and Means Committee, the Agricultural Committee, and the Homeland Security Committee, as well as the Science and Technology Committee. Uh, and I'm spending my time now a bit on the farm where we do a little farming and other stuff. But uh, North Carolina is the 10th largest state in the nation, very diversified, uh, a lot of agricultural products, technology, and trade. This morning, talking about think tanks, you know, think tanks are, are made up of the institutions or corporations that really specialize in knowledge to perform in-depth research on a whole wide range of issues. And in the United States, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,984 think tanks. I mean, there are a lot of people thinking. And <laughs> about, and about 20% of those, 400 of them, are located in Washington, D.C. So, and they're on a variety of issues. There are think tanks, the Libertarian, which is a very uh, limited government, uh, shrinking really there are many that my republican colleagues listen to like the hoover and the cato and then there are others that the democrats pay attention to uh, and probably one of the newest one is the center for american projects or cap uh, relatively new one uh, been deeply involved in the clinton obama administration other seems to that each president sort of has one over the years, they're very helpful. They make a difference. But we also have to remember where your information comes from. I like to say it's attribution. Attribution is where do you get your information? Know who's doing it. Know what the reason is behind it. And listen to more than one source. Because if you're only listening to one source, pretty soon, uh, you know, it's like a person with one leg. It's kind of hard standing up and, and, and having stability. So you need more than one source of attribution so that you make good, sound policy decisions. Now, one other thing to say about think tanks, there are a number that deal with uh, foreign policy. There are a number that deal with the military. Former um, Secretary of State Colin Powell and uh, Madeleine Albright are involved in a think tank that deals really with foreign policy. So if you really want to learn some in-depth stuff, on what's happening, you can really go to them, but know who's behind it, know who, you know, know who's writing it, and then you then you take that information, and 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 use it with other information, and you can really make good decisions. Uh, I look forward to our discussion today. Think 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 tanks are important. They provide a a real in depth uh, research certainly for members of Congress, but let me add one additional piece. Congress also has its own research arm called the Congressional Research Service that members of Congress can go to, get information that's unbiased in any way. There's nothing more than really in-depth research on any issue. And uh, I used it uh, quite a bit when I was in Congress because when you do that, you really know that uh, you're getting it unvarnished information uh, you may not like what you get, but you're going to get information that's accurate uh, and, and correct. So I look forward to the questions. Well, I'll start, uh, given, given what you mentioned, I'll start with you, uh, Congressman Etheridge. You mentioned libertarian think tanks. Uh, I, I used to work for one called the Mercatus Center, which is uh, uh, also in D.C., yes. uh, and, you know, many of my colleagues, uh, uh, you know, um, go to deliver congressional testimony, uh, to testify before the Senate and, and, and various Congress people on whatever the issue of the day is. Uh, and one of the accusations, or one of the claims that circulates uh, uh, in, the, in, the general, in the general public uh, is that, you know, these congressional testimonies are much more sort of processions and there isn't actually anyone's opinion isn't being affected. It's just more a case of you'll bring in your pals, your opponents will bring in their pals and, and it's just, uh, uh, you know, a bit of chest thumping and everybody goes home. So how would you respond? Do you, do you, you indicated in what you were saying that actually, no, these are, you know, inf informative sessions. So how would you convince a member of the general public that this is not just a procession, that there is actually you know, important discourse going on in these in these testimonies? Well, as you can appreciate having worked with a, an institute, uh, the members obviously need to know the attribution where it came from. 
The public may not know that, but that's why you have differing views on both sides of the aisle talking. And in many cases, as, as you're well aware, uh, that information is as much for the general public as it is for the members of Congress, whether it be the United States Senate or the House, because many of those programs uh, are either on C-SPAN, which a lot of folks do watch, or if it is an issue of some internet, major international or national concern, people would tend to turn on it on the evening news or on some of these 24 hour, you know, 24 seven news uh, programs and they get a level of information. That's the reason I say you need to know the attribution of where it comes from, because if the folks think there is bias in it, they may tend to discount it. And I think everything has a little bit of good information you can use. So you really ought to use, bounce it off several different sources so you can come to what I think is a good policy decisions. And I think members of Congress try to do that by and large. I really do. Uh, that's why they get elected. Now they get elected by a group of constituents who want to do want them to do certain things, and uh, sometimes you can't do it one out of 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate, and then ultimately the president's got to be willing to sign it. Uh, Congressman Bishop, uh, so uh, the um, uh, some of the think tanks that uh, uh, Congressman Etheridge mentioned, for example, Cato. Uh, on the libertarian side, then you've got maybe somewhere like Heritage Foundation on the Re traditional republic, somewhere like CAP, uh, uh, you know, traditional Democrat. Uh, do you think, so these, these, these are think tanks that have clear agendas or clear positions. Then you've got think tanks like, you know, CSIS, Center for Strategic and International Studies, or, um, which don't have any clear uh, uh, agenda or any clear political leaning. And I don't mean that they're nonpartisan, I just mean that they, you know, they sort of transcend uh, uh, any sort of uh, uh, particular uh, intellectual school of thought. Do you think that uh, think tanks should be should be allowed, should have agendas, or, or they should be just sort of uh, strive to be uh, themselves impartial uh, uh, conveyors, uh, analysts, and conveyors of information? Well, <clears throat> I, I don't know that it's. I don't know that it's possible to have a think tank with, without an agenda. Um, I, I, you, we have, as Congressman Etheridge uh, mentioned, we, we do have the Congressional Research uh, Group that uh, gives us what is, um, what is unbiased information uh, that we ask for uh, research that's done. But I don't ever recall engaging a a um, think tank that didn't have some sort of agenda, but I don't take offense to that. I, I, I know what, where they're coming from. My role as a, as a legislator uh, is, to, is to gather information. And I, I know that uh, sometimes I'm, the folks that give me information are not necessarily, you know, in my, in my political uh, alignment, but, that's part of the process. You have to hear both sides. And we're kind of a jury uh, to a certain extent in that case, because we listen to all these different sides and uh, we let them present their case. And it helps us in the decision-making process because it gives us, it's a reflection of society. And really public policy is what society deems is just and right. And in order to, to really be able to uh, come to a conclusion that's proper, you have, to, you have to weigh all of the facts and uh, all of the options. Uh, my biggest think tank, our biggest think tank as members of Congress was our constituent base. Mm -hmm. So that's part of, you know, part of our consideration. Uh, we have traditional think tanks, Cato, Heritage, uh, um, as you mentioned, but we also have public universities and, and colleges in, in, that have done a great job in presenting um, issues. Uh, the University of Michigan, my alma mater, uh, has, has a great rich history in public policy, as does, say, Hillsdale College uh, in, in Michigan. Uh, just to name, you know, to give a shout out to my Michigan institutions. Uh, we, we get information from everywhere. And I think they all, to a certain extent, have an agenda. Um, and, I've, I, and I recognize that, and I, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, Congressman Etheridge, uh, sorry. 
Obama, you know, had President Obama had two terms, uh, and there were quite a lot of uh, uh, how should we say um, important and somewhat radical. I mean, radical in the sense of very non-abnormal, not necessarily not extreme, uh, uh, but non-traditional policies uh, that were enacted uh, during Obama's time. Most notably, the Affordable Health Health Care uh, uh, Act, and you know, which are very revolutionary if you take a sort of macroscopic view of uh, of American political history. Uh, what was the what role did think tanks play uh, in the genesis? Uh, were, they, were they in the genesis of these ideas, or were they in the promotion, or sort of where did they fit in to the production chain? To the you know to uh, when they happened, things like the Iran deal, the, the nuclear deal, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, that's a great question, and I don't know all the depth and background on it because well, by the time it got to the Congress. Obviously, a lot of people have been involved, but you have to understand that the issue, the healthcare issue, let me just take that as one piece of it to begin with, actually goes back, gosh, roughly 100 years uh, to a Republican by the name of Teddy Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and then to another Roosevelt as a Democrat in FDR, and then Truman, who was a Democrat, and presidents for over 100 years had talked about how we should add you know, healthcare for people. How important it was. And as time moved on, healthcare in the United States, by and large, has been tied to your job or as an individual. You know, you got your health care where you work, the employer was involved, they got a deduction for it. And individuals didn't necessarily get that. So the health care bill became, was somewhat modeled after the uh, uh, health care bill in Massachusetts of then Governor Romney. And, you know, changes were made to it in the process. And then compromises in the legislative process always make changes. And you may start, but it gets changed. And that's what happened to the Affordable Care Act. And ultimately, by the time it passed, uh, it was not that radical. It was really a pretty conservative piece of legislation. Uh, the press made it and the opponents made it different, but it was a whole lot more conservative than it started out. And uh, a lot like what happened in Massachusetts, it afforded millions of people an opportunity to have health care and allowed people who had never had health care an opportunity to have it through exchanges, et cetera. And it changed for that process because I know I served on the Ways and Means Committee when the bill came through. Uh, in exchange, the states were given a uh, substantial opportunity to, to enact Medicaid. And most of the states have about 30, some of the 50 states, 37, 38 of the 50 states have enacted Medicaid, which is, which adds additional people uh, to it, uh, who were not able to buy health care or were not tied to a job with health care. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of the different health care think tanks were involved in the development of that process. Uh, I'm sure some of the listeners may remember uh, a health care bill surfaced in the early days of the Clinton administration. And obviously think tanks were involved in that. I don't know which one. That never got off the ground because of a whole host of issues that surfaced. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act, many would say, uh, was on life support for a long time before it ever finally passed. So it was not you know, major legislation that passes uh, in the United States Car Congress historically is never easy. And it takes time, even after it passes, for the public to embrace it unless it is a major national catastrophic event. Uh, obviously, a lot of people needed health care, but that was not a catastrophic event. Uh, if you remember, in, after 9-11, uh, major legislation passed the United States Congress in a bipartisan manner, so the, uh, the country accepted it very quickly. The Affordable Care Act started out, or Obamacare, as it became named by a lot of folks who opposed it, uh, became a symbol of opposition. And it's amazing now, four, five, eight years, almost 10 years later, it now is being embraced by far more people. It is accepted. And now it's almost become an issue that if you aren't for it, then there's, you know, there's a problem. So the, 
to answer your first question in depth, I'm sure that think tanks had input. I don't know which ones did. Uh, certainly the ones, the Kaiser Foundation, I think, uh, a number of the others that deal with healthcare issues would have weighed in very heavily. Uh, as did a number of the <coughs> business, uh, they're not called think tanks, but a lot of business people uh, and healthcare groups have people on the Hill and in Washington. And I'm sure they saw a need of an opportunity to, to get engaged, it would have an impact on their bottom line as well. Uh, Congressman Bishop, uh, so you have a picture of President, former President Ronald Reagan behind you. Uh, and when he, <clears throat> when he served, he famously, uh, I believe, hired a lot of people, appointed a lot of people who worked in Heritage Foundation uh, uh, in, in, in uh, important government positions. And for those who are not aware, Heritage Foundation is a you know, traditional conservative uh, uh, think tank. How do you think that, uh, uh, you know, changed... Uh, um, uh, heritage foundation, first of all, and how did it affect government? I mean, the, I think I mean all all uh, presidents like to take people from the think tank community, but I think in the case of Reagan, uh, it was quite remarkable how many he took from a single institution. Uh, did that, you know, what's how do you reflect on that now, forty years after the event? Well, I think that. President Reagan, uh, whom I revere, as is evident by my picture on the wall, I, I, uh, I grew up in an environment, uh, we discussed this earlier, I, I wasn't old enough to vote for him, but I revered him because he uh, was a man that I felt really treated that office with the ultimate respect and, and uh, was such a great communicator um, growing up. I, I, I just, that was a day and age when it really meant something to be in elected government. You, you really re you looked up to people in elected government. That's how I view it still today. I, I, I still put it on a pedestal. Um, Ronald Reagan, I think, did uh, was one of those leaders who uh, circled himself with people that were very competent. Um, he recognized his own shortcomings and surrounded himself with people that really knew how to run their area of the government. Part of what he also acknowledged was that he needed help with public policy. Our country he, at he the was time, not a, an, He was not a DC insider, right? He came from a, a non-political background. Well, he was governor of, of, of California, but you're right. He was not really known as a, as a government insider. He, uh, um, he, he, was a, he was a person who I think people felt really wanted to make a positive difference to our country. And we were in a uh, kind of an economic malaise at the time. Um, uh, President Carter went through some difficult times uh, at, at that time, economic times. We had, we had um, hostages in Iran at the time. That uh, was resolved. But President Reagan was looking for something very positive. So he wanted to have a full policy agenda. And he, he used, utilized the think tank, I think, in a very positive way. Um, a lot of these think tanks, and I would include uh, Heritage as one of them, have changed a lot over the years. Um, I don't think the heritage of the 1980s is the same as the heritage of today. Um, and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that there's a, more of a cutting edge to our think tanks now. And I think they've moved more uh, agenda driven than they were in the past. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact of social media. You say, and, so you say they're more ideological or more, what, what's the difference? What well, do you mean? More, more, more ideological, yes, uh, more political in nature, more polit, uh, like for example, I, Heritage uh, and Heritage Action Group, uh, they, they've got political organizations and, and, uh, and engines behind them that uh, move their agenda. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I, I think all of us that are in elected government know where they stand. And, um, but I do believe that think tanks have been impacted dramatically, as has the country, by social media. Uh, and Congressman uh, uh, Etheridge, um, in the case of, so going back to this issue of, so the case of her heritage, what we see regularly uh, is a flow of personnel from important government positions to think tanks uh, as a circular. Uh, you know, uh, going forwards and backwards. Uh, many think tanks in DC, you mentioned there were, you know, a, a good 400 
they have former ambassadors and former uh, you know, uh, ministers uh, uh, as their leaders, as their chair people. Uh, do you think that's uh, uh, do you think that's healthy? Do you think that's uh, uh, it's good to have that to and fro, or do you think that it should be more more like university where you you won't you know apart from you, you get the odd you know Condoleezza Rice, but in general, you know the academic the research and study in university is untainted if you want to use the right word by uh, you know uh, going to and fro in positions uh, with government. Do you think it's a problem, or do you think it's it's completely it's it's a desirable uh, uh, attribute of a, of the think tank community? Well, it's a great question because historically, you know, if you go back 40, 50 years, uh, when people left government, they went to the academic side. You know, they'd go to a university somewhere, and that's where a lot of these other think tanks were set up. You know, you have them at university settings, mm -hmm. uh, and over the last uh, 40 years probably, as resources. And I think there, there's, uh, there's two, piece, two things going on. There's availability, because originally, when they went back to the universities, there wasn't that kind of resource available in Washington. People weren't willing to invest that kind of money in a think tank set, that set aside doing nothing but policy, dealing with government policy. Uh, and over the last 40 years, that has changed. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether that's good or bad. Uh, certainly in the day, in the current environment, as uh, Congressman Bishop said with social media, I think a lot of these Washington-based think tanks now are really uh, having to re sort of refocus how they do things. Uh, historically, they spent time between administrations developing policy, they always, they almost became, whether they were Democratic leaning or Republican leaning, they became a sort of an alternative place for the other party to get ideas, to get new fresh ideas to work with, where we used to reach back to our states and districts. And we still do some of that, but you also got this other alternative place to get information, these think tanks. Uh, I think time will tell how, uh, how positive that is. I think thus far it has been very helpful. Certainly it's been my experience because I use that as just one source. If you're using it as your only source, I think you do tend to get tunnel vision. Then it leads to more partisanship and less homogenation or enrichment of good public policy. I hope that helps answer your yeah. question. Uh, Congressman Bishop, uh, so, you know, uh, Congressman Etheridge mentioned at the beginning that the, the sheer number of think tanks, about 2,000 think tanks in, in the U.S., uh, that number has been steadily rising the last 50 years. Uh, and the, you know, there was a, the, the sector, the entire nonprofit sector, including think tanks, took a hit in 2008 with the global financial crisis. But things got back on track a few years after that. But now with COVID, you know, some of these think tanks are under, uh, you know, un, unprecedented uh, uh, economic pressure. And for the first time, you know, in the history of this movement, we're really looking at the possibility of a major uh, contraction uh, in the number of uh, think active think tanks. Uh, so do you think this is something which should be uh, uh, just left to happen, uh, left to sort itself out with market forces? Or do you think that this is something which government should be involved in, in, in you know, in, in the same way that it's protecting airlines or protecting other strategic sectors? Should there be some effort, government effort to protect the think tank community? Well, just about every uh, sector of the American economy, and I'm sure this is true worldwide, is being impacted by the pandemic, as did happen here in the United States back in the 2000s when, well, you know, and especially I can give you uh, my personal experience in the state of Michigan. We, uh, we went through an economic depression. Uh, it was terrible. And right now, I, I, I still feel the economy is viable. It, uh, it's, it's, it's got its strengths and it's got its weaknesses and the government's trying to do what it can to, to um, prop up certain sectors of the economy. Uh, the question is, you know, how, how do you possibly prop up every sector? Uh, I think our media um, at every level uh, is, is being impacted. Um, there's hardly a newspaper anymore that's printed in this country anymore. Uh, because of the contractions in our economy and the, and the, the push towards a digital environment. 
Um, that's how we get our information in most cases, traditionally, um, the pu general public does. Uh, when it comes to think tanks, they're utilized, you know, uh, very much so at, at, uh, by members of government uh, in, in various areas of, of business and, and private and public sector. Do I think the government should get involved? I, I, uh, I, I'd be open to the discussion as to how that can happen, but the, the government is, what are we now, $26 trillion uh, in, in debt that we know of, and uh, it's growing. I, uh, it's hard to imagine that government can be more involved in economic bailouts right now. Um, but I, I will say that I value the input of the every think tank that I've worked with if I've agreed with them or not. Uh, to me, it makes me a, a much more well-rounded um, elected member of government. And it's my responsibility. I always viewed it as my responsibility to make sure that I knew both sides of every issue um, thoroughly. And I considered every aspect of, of public policy before uh, my final vote. I, I, was, I, I spent a lot of time on these uh, think tank websites in my research. Um, I had regular meetings with uh, folks that have been involved in think tanks and that were currently participating in think tanks. Uh, th this, this is very important to our process. And as we evolve into a, um, a 21st century uh, style of, of government, I don't know where this is going. And I don't know how uh, think tanks will be involved, but they continue to evolve uh, as time goes on. And I see your son in the background, he's peeking <laughs> through. <laughs> he wants to be a part of this discussion. He wants to be a part of it. He must be a future think tank uh, scholar. <laughs> Uh, Congressman Etheridge, uh, so you've been, you know, what you've, one of the areas you've worked in uh, a lot is education. Uh, so, you know, ed education is not obviously a particularly sexy topic for a think tank uh, on DC. They're much more into sort of security, uh, uh, and national defense, that kind of thing. Uh, um, but there, there is a thriving education subsector within the think tank community. Uh, so could you give an example of, uh, of uh, you know, a notable, uh, uh, you know, uh, instance where an education think tank really made you look at a, a problem a different way and, and enriched, uh, enriched the debate? Yes, and thank you for the question, because that's so important. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, one of the real challenges in public education is the fact that everybody has some and everybody has an idea how it ought to be done which makes it very difficult uh, for teachers and parents to do things they need to do. Uh, but I think we're now seeing through, and this is sort of a regression, uh, but now that we're going through this COVID-19 problem, there are a lot of parents who have really come to appreciate what teachers do. I can tell you from my grandchildren and others I've talked with who are dealing with it, they understand. Now, uh, let me mention one other thing before I go to answer your question. Mike mentioned the newspapers. Since 2004 here in the United States, roughly 1,800 weeklies and daily newspapers have closed in our communities. And that means that in a lot of our rural communities or in our small towns, uh, we've really lost, we've lost a lot when you lose a newspaper because you've lost that in-depth work gets done and information about local communities, how people really democratize local communities. Don't know how we fix that because social media is just not the way to do it. It's out there, but they don't do the in-depth research. Now to get to your question about uh, education and think tanks, by and large education think tanks have been tied to our universities and the U.S. Department of Education by and large. Now, certainly there are some funded think tanks, you know, as a subset of some of the other think tanks that are out there. But the Department of Education historically has um, had a pretty good, what I call best practice. What that means is if in the state of Michigan or the state of California or somewhere else came up with some really good practices that would work in with low-income children, children with special needs. You know, you get the idea. All the whole long list of problems a teacher might have. The Department of Education historically, and I assume, I hope they're still doing it, 
you would have to put together a package. It would have to be peer reviewed, but that means some other people have to review it and say it makes sense. Then they would post it and you could pull that down and use it. And then educators are really um, willing to take good ideas, contrary to what a lot of people think. If somebody's got a better idea, they'll share it. If a teacher down the hall in the classroom's got a good idea, they'll share it. Uh, because they really do want to do better. If you got a, ch a child that has a certain learning disability and another teacher has done it, they'll share it. So there is a lot of going on, but I don't know of any, and I'm sure there may be one out there, but we never used a large think tank other than through our university settings. And the universities do a good job of that. And that's one of the areas they really are good at. Uh, there aren't as many research teaching university uh, uh, units as they are, but as they used to be, because they're more, uh, they don't return the, the dollar and cents to the bottom line of a university like teaching does. Let me put it that way. But there's still a lot of research going on at those university levels. And that's really where, by and large, in public education, and I think probably in private education too, for that matter. They're drawing their research. Uh, and uh, Congressman Bishop, the you know uh, 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 we mentioned the the large number of think tanks uh, that the U.S. has, and in fact, it's it's got more than any other country by by a distance. Uh, uh, maybe not in per capita terms, but the, but the num the, the sheer number of think tanks and the appetite for funding think tanks in the U.S. is 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 without parallel <laughs> anywhere else in the world. How do you you know what do you think the reason for that is? I mean, the U.S. is yeah, it does have the best universities in the world. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but, but even that isn't in proportion to the uh, amount of funding that gets funneled towards think tanks. Why do you think there is such an appetite, a disproportionately high appetite for think tanks in the US compared to other countries, even you know ones with comparable political systems and comparable uh, uh, levels of uh, uh, income per capita? Well, I, th I think it's because they're a reliable and credible resource. And um, they're, they're, for the most part, in, in my opinion, run by people who are very competent and uh, with a lot of uh, very talented people that work for them that are able to, um, you know, assist in, a, in the process of, of policy making. And everybody's looking for uh, a way to have an edge in this world. You know, you, we've maximized and made ourselves more efficient in every process. And we uh, we find that the the uh, the think tanks are are great places to incubate ideas and to launch them. So I I think the reason why there's so many in this country is because they're utilized and uh, we we really rely on them and that we find them to be credible resources for the work that we do. So I you know I don't I, I'm concerned that you know we we don't as this, this economy contracts, that things are changing dramatically. And unfortunately people are, many people get their news from Facebook nowadays, uh, which is, is tragic. So in my opinion, uh, I would like to see this country move from a social, um, you know, a, a social media perspective to more of a think tank perspective. It, it, it allows us to have real uh, in-depth efficient, responsible, reasonable thought in this country, civil discourse. And the more we, we move away from that, the more intolerant we become as, as Americans. And this country uh, is, is very young compared to the rest of the world. And we have certain ideas. It's so, our history is so close to us that we have certain ideas of who we are and why we are. And as time has gone by, I think we're, we're slowly pulling away from our roots um, and being um, thinking less like our forefathers did and and why our forefathers created this great republic in this country. Um, I really revere um, the kind of educational discussion uh, we had in, in civil discourse in this country and I think much of that emanates from groups like think tanks. And as we see the deterioration of our civil discourse, I think you can look directly at the movement away from 
uh, this this idea of having civil discourse and um, this idea of having a group of competent people incubating ideas. So um, I hope that, you know, the best case scenario that we can move back to where the direction we were coming back, get back on the path. Uh, but it's going to take a strong effort in the part of this country uh, to refocus. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, just another question, but before that, I'm going to, uh, going to open up the floor for Q&A soon. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, put those in the, in the Q&A section. We'll be happily posing those uh, to, uh, to our guests. Uh, and another question for you, uh, Congressman Etheridge. Yeah, you know, so, in you know, you've been uh, you, your, your political career spans several decades. Uh, you know, we, we've discussed that things have changed. Uh, the way think tanks operate have changed a little bit over the years. Uh, one of those, as Congressman Bethel, uh, intimated, is in this sense, instance, in social media. To be honest, you know, I, I follow several think tanks on on, on Twitter, and I, I, I'm very dismayed. I share Congressman Bishop's dismay about how the message has to get watered down and watered down into something that into 140 characters uh, for something that's actually very nuanced uh, uh, and requires a lot more depth. Uh, what other, uh, so that's something which we've covered. Any other sort of major changes, macroscopic, big picture changes you've witnessed over the last 30, 40 years, maybe good, maybe bad, uh, in, in the way think tanks uh, uh, interact with policy? Well, I, I, I agree with Congressman Bishop and, and your assessment too, because I, I've seen the drift. Uh, you know, we are, we are at a point, certainly, uh, here in, here in the country, and I think it's true in a lot of places around the world, we've gotten to the point where we want everything instantaneous. You know, we want it like we want our instant coffee. We want it right now. And we're, we don't want to do the kind of in-depth research that will give us the better ideas. Historically, if you didn't have all the data, you had to go do some reading. You'd go to, you know, when many of us were going to school, you had to go to the library. Well, today you go to your computer. Going to that library had more than one use of just get knowledge. You saw people, you talked, you interacted. Something you may have been working on, someone else may have done. Uh, and, and that's happened in my years in public education. You know, people have to come together in groups. I think one of the real problems we face now, one of the, one of the challenges, I guess is a better way to put it, Coronavirus has stopped us from having meetings where people can come together, face to face, talk and interact. Public education, healthcare, a lot of the social things that each of us as social human beings want to do, we don't get to travel like we used to. Those are important things in our society, domestically in the United States and internationally that are important. Yes, we're a nation of immigrants here in the United States, we're so diverse, but that diversity is our strength. And that strength comes from being able to interact and know other people. Well, if you don't get to meet them and all you can do is send them a tweet or you send out an email, <laughs> there is no personal contact and you will say and do nasty things that you wouldn't dare say to a person's face. That's an education process. We didn't used to have that. You know, you had to go see someone if you want to do it, or you had to write a letter and you had to compose. Uh, that's a change I've seen and a lot of that's taken place in the last 20 years. Uh, we'll get through it, we'll be better for it, we'll, we'll get past it, and we'll come back and be together again. I, can, I think we've turned the corner, we haven't quite turned it yet, but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's coming. And we're going to figure out how to work it. And it'll make us, we'll, we'll have learned from the process and we'll be better as a nation and as a world. Thank you. So the first uh, Q&A question is going to be to Congressman Bishop and it's a tough one. Uh, so you're getting a, a nice curveball to start you off with. It's uh, We have uh, uh, Sandeep Singh, who's a, a, a local, he's a, a, a correspondent for uh, one of the local English language newspapers, the Gulf Daily News. And he asks, why do you think some think tanks in the West continue to be, continue to be biased with their research or white papers relating to Gulf and Arab countries? Uh, so uh, just to give you some background or some context, uh, if you were to 
randomly sample the research that gets conducted in DC think tanks about the Gulf countries. Um, it's, I think it's fair to say that, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it would be viewed uh, as biased by uh, many stakeholders uh, uh, in, in, in the Gulf countries themselves. Um, so why do you think, uh, is, that, is that inevitable? Uh, is that something which, which should be addressed, can be addressed? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's just like anything else. Uh, there, we, I think everybody can, uh, if, if you're in public policy, you, you know that there are groups out there that uh, are biased. Think tanks are are not are not um, out of that, you know that that group of, of of organizations that can be biased. So uh, you you have to weigh information from each entity uh, based on their credibility and and uh, and their believability and 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 their history. Uh, there are a lot of different factors that go into the idea of credibility. Um, I just think the world is so biased right now that it, it's hard to it's hard to find an organization that's not biased. So every time you you know you listen to any organization, you have to keep that in mind um, and be prepared to apply your own experience, your own objective uh, 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 opinion on, on on issues like this. I have no idea why the Gulf countries would have groups that would be biased against them or for them. I, I, I guess I do understand for them. Um, there's a lot of history there. There's a, there's a lot of politics there, uh, maybe some competition. Um, so I think there's ample reason why they would be biased, but um, it's up to those who, who consume the information to apply credibility to it. So let me ask you a follow-up uh, on that in that regard. So the you know one of the one of the problems, one of the reasons, uh, uh, or one I should say, one of the phenomena that's been accompanying this general deterioration in the quality of public discourse has been diminishing trust in the media. Uh, and one uh, uh, and you know uh, one of uh, some of the intellectuals whom I follow on Twitter, one remark I've seen repeated uh, is that uh, so when you you know if I was to write an article uh, in the New York Times and quote a congressman, it would say after that congressman's name, whether they're Republican or Democrat, you know, uh, between uh, parentheses, so that anyone reading has a sense of what that person's political background is. But if I was uh, uh, to be cited in, in an article in the New York Times, I said, Omar Bailey says, blah, 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 blah. It'd just say that I work at a think tank and it wouldn't say anything about who's funding me, you know, anything, any, there'd be no context uh, about uh, um, uh, uh, my political leanings or, or who's funding me or any potential conflicts of interest. And the claim uh, or, or the suggestion I've seen proposed is that in order to improve trust in media and to prevent distortions in the political process, when experts give comments to the media, when they appear on you know, Fox or CNN or whatever, uh, and they're from think tanks, uh, whoever's funding those think tanks should be made more salient. And this is something that would improve credibility around. Do you agree, Congressman Bishop, with that? Or do you think that's just, uh, that's just making excuses and it's not really a problem? No, no, no. I, I, you, you indicated earlier that we reduce everything into a, a 140 character soundbite. And that, uh, that is the problem. And because we do that, we can't provide information that is salient to the discussion. Um, I think the more information you can give the reader, the better, um, better off both sides are. I, journalism has changed dramatically with the onslaught of, of, of social media and the way in which we communicate. Um, Congressman Etheridge mentioned before about when we used to go to the library and do research. When we did research, we, we provided sites um, for all of our research, where it came from and uh, dates and everything. That, that is how a reader, as someone who was presented with research information, is able to, um, you know, to, to decide whether or not uh, the argument that's being made is a credible one. It, and we, as a consumer of that information, um, deserve all that, all of the background to help us decide and to apply credibility to information. 
Uh, Congressman Athos, we have a question uh, from uh, another uh, participant, uh, Naila uh, uh, Barakat, who says, the US has 2,000 think tanks. How can a country like Bahrain, which has, you know, I think I believe single digits, we may have over 10, how can it, le how can it collaborate and learn from the experience you know, the, the depth and wealth of this experience of U.S. think tanks. Do you, if you were, if, if you were to be appointed chair, chairman of a, of a Bahraini think tank uh, and you were charged with, uh, you know, learning from the U.S. experience, what would you instruct your, your colleagues to do? Two things. If we didn't have COVID-19, I would find a way to, I'd find a way that we could collaborate, have a meeting with some of the leadership and sit down who, you know, had philosophies similar to what I wanted, or even if they were different. So we could get together and talk and share information. Number two, since we can't do that, what I would do is do just what we're doing today. Have Zoom meetings, reach out to them because there's no reason why information shouldn't travel and shouldn't be shared. Good, solid, in-depth research, verified information, uh, you know, on healthcare and on education. There may be issues that we feel uncomfortable brain maybe feel uncomfortable sharing or the united states may that's fine if it was a strategic but there's no reason not to share good information that improves the quality of life for people no matter where they live no matter what their economic or ethnic background is think tanks started out doing that they ought to get back to doing a lot more of that uh congressman bishop I have a question to you from uh faisal uh so you know, as a context, you know, you've seen decrease, decreasing multilateralism and decreasing respect for international law being uh, a trends, unfortunately, in the last 10, 15 years globally. Uh, what do you think uh, think tanks role is in, in potentially reversing that process? Uh, and do you think that international law is actually highly politicized uh, and, and that it's actually incapable of being a, a positive regulating force in its current guise? Or do you think it, it is international law is a good thing and that think tanks can play a role? If so, you know, what are your reflections on that? Well, I think think tanks could very much play a positive role in that process to raise awareness to issues that are going on around this country, around this world, excuse me. We, uh, this world is really uh, making a difficult transition into a more global economy, into a more global perspective. The 21st century has brought about uh, so much technology and so many uh, different advancements that we now do more than we've ever done before, look at our world as global. And I think it's important for us to rely on think tanks, uh, credible sources to help us understand. Because again, you know, when I travel the world, it's shocking to me how much history there is out there uh, in different countries, thousands and thousands of years of, uh, of history uh, that we're not used to in the United States. We have a very a myopic view of the world, I would say, in our country uh, that is, that's pervasive. We need the assistance of the global community. Uh, what, whatever organization we can find, think tanks I think are very important to help educate us on the history of countries, the reason why, uh, for example, there may be bias in, in um, the think tanks in the, in, in the Gulf, Coast re Gulf, Gulf region. Um, you know, we don't understand it in the United States. So I think to understand international law, we need to understand countries and the reason why they created that law in the first place, why uh, public policy was created to uh, um, by China or by Taiwan or, or, or by uh, uh, Brazil, whatever the case may be. Um, we need that kind of information to help us understand and uh, understanding public policy is is not so easy if you don't understand the history and, and some of the in-depth behind the public policy. And a follow-up question for you, Congressman Bishop, is from uh, Anush, Anush Singh, who said, you mentioned that social media has contributed to think tanks having a more outward political agenda. Uh, what do you believe is the impact of this on readers turning into think tanks for information as opposed to other sources of news information? So if, if I was to paraphrase, I'd say, you know, if you, if you, if you had to rank different sources of information, uh, has where do think tanks fall in that ranking, and how does the you know the, the social media age? How has the social media age affected think tanks' position in that hierarchy or in that ecosystem? Of, uh... I, I think that it's changed the credibility. It, it's it's impacted the credibility of think tanks. 
uh, think tanks are known as thoughtful, uh, resourceful, uh, voluminous information coming together uh, so that uh, you can tap into it and look at it and get perspective, uh, your own perspective. Social media has created an environment where if you want to participate, you have to distill information into a small uh, uh, thought, just a tiny um, uh, thought um, that you hope will grab attention to the reader. Because if it doesn't, they won't, they won't, they won't stop and look at it. And in most cases, they'll read the, the, the thought and that's it. They won't do any further research. So I think that you, it's impossible to put a thought together and distill it to that kind of uh, message and not be biased. It, it just, it doesn't work. So eventually people will see an organization uh, in social media and, and they're, they're gonna see so many biased posts and thought bubbles that it's gonna be impossible for that organization to be looked at as objective in any way, shape or form. And I think that's a real, that's gonna deteriorate the, uh, the, the um, environment for, uh, for um, think tanks and their credibility. I, I, I'm very concerned about that. So I, I don't know how you change that and less reliance on, on social media, but that's how the world gets its information these days. And the final question from me will be to Congressman Etheridge. Uh, so I think we're all agreed that social media has its pros and has its cons. Um, uh, uh, now, think tanks are not the only entities that lobby uh, the government in DC. Uh, companies also lobby, uh, among them social media companies. Um, do you think that uh, uh, you know, um, the US government uh, has been able to uh, uh, you know, respond to the either explicit or tacit lobbying efforts of companies like Facebook uh, uh, and to create, uh, you know, uh, an environment in which, uh, a wholesome environment for social media to, 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 con to contribute uh, 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 and not potentially damage uh, societal fabric? Well, I think we're seeing that play out right now in, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> in real time. Uh, and <laughs> Yeah. And, and the real problem is the expertise to really understand what's happening uh, in social media, the, the bright people that are behind that, uh, who have really transformed not just the United States, but the world. Uh, I'm not sure Congress has um, the resources. They have the resources, but they don't have the expertise right now, other than dealing with uh, just a issue of uh, companies are too big. You know, that's the only piece they can deal with. Some of, them, some, some of them seem to have a lot of expertise in using the social media themselves. Yes, they do. And I think, I think that's a real challenge. I think this, we're going, I really believe we're going through a period we did in this country probably over 100 years ago trying to figure out how do we deal with this dramatic change that's taking place. Uh, very quickly, we've gone through several changes in, in America then and in the world. You know, the movement in the agricultural revolution, then the industrial revolution, then the technology revolution. And now we're in the second phase of technology revolution that's moving not just words, that's using face, sound, and the whole bit. And we're really struggling with it. Um, and... Congressman Bishop just talked about. It. I think it's a real tough issue working through it. How do we, how do we find a way to educate people so they have in-depth knowledge to make good decisions? Uh, I don't think we have a good handle on that yet. I would just say stay tuned. I think over the next several years you're going to see some more changes in that whole environment. Uh, and with that, I would like to express my uh, deep gratitude personally and on behalf of Dirasat to Congressman Bishop and Congressman Etheridge for their participation today, to the U.S. Embassy for facilitating this for uh, uh, Rabia Qureshi, uh, and to all those who attended and took the time to ask questions. Uh, and do please uh, subscribe to events at dirasat.org to the BH to be uh, kept abreast of all our future events. Uh, and Congressman, I, I hope you stay in good health. Uh, and uh, remember to vote uh, between now and November if you haven't done so already. Same to you. I've already voted. Yeah. <laughs>
I'm an in-person guy. You're an in-person guy. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening or day. Thank you. Thank you.